Uh, and, uh, well, thanks very much, Richard, and uh, thanks to the organisers for having me. Uh, let me just um, get to the right point. Uh, so, uh, my name is Richard Spenty. I'm uh, at the University of Cambridge, uh, and um, going on from uh, Peter's presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of those photonic integrated, or at least uh, photonic integrated circuits that go in that assembly that, that he was talking about. Uh, and in particular, I, I want to talk about um, uh, photonic integrated circuits uh, of optical switches, both space, but also space and wavelength switches. Uh, and I'll uh, just motivate that very briefly for this conference. In, in, uh, we've been trying to sort of uh, work on uh, optical switches for about 20 years now, and uh, optical switches are, are going to become commercial in five years' time uh, over that entire 20-year period. But uh, finally, um, there, there probably is an application where optical switching is uh, something which is likely to uh, actually become real. Uh, and, and, and that's for putting optical switching as part of an AI data center. And the reason for that is if you take uh, the, the various things that, uh, that take place in AI, so training inference, data mining, uh, 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 et cetera, then if you, um, if you want to try to um, set up your, your uh, uh, data center uh, appropriately for each of those different uh, uh, applications, then you, you will actually reconfigure it uh, differently. So the, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, logical connections are different depending on what the, uh, the uh, traffic pattern of the application is. Uh, and if you can use, uh, it, it, it obviously it will need a requirement for both electrical switching, but also optical switching for the, uh, at the very high level. Uh, and uh, in particular for steering the bandwidth around uh, with, uh, with these uh, flexible topologies. Uh, and indeed, we're, we're uh, about to, because it's the deadline for ECOC tomorrow, uh, we're about to submit a paper with NVIDIA where, where we're doing precisely this, using one of our optical switches and, of course, uh, their network architectures. So, um, the, uh, uh, so going back a long time, uh, th this, this is uh, so our first major integrated switch. Uh, it, it was pu first published about 15 years ago. Uh, and if you look at it, uh, it it's sort of uh, it's something like a six millimeter by a six millimeter switch, and each of these sort of squares here is a, a four by four broadcast and select optical switch. So you, you take uh, an input, you split it four ways, and then you block the three that you don't want, uh, and then in a Benish architecture, uh, you can then connect all of the sixteen inputs to an output. And we can make that work. Uh, it, it's quite compact because we use this total internal reflection uh, in, in the chip. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, it's got lossless operation. The, sorry. The, um, the, uh, it's an all active device. So all of this uh, is a um, indium phosphide based. And you have to put currents into it to uh, activate the path that you want. The problem is, uh, because it's an all-active device, is this. It, it, it consumes about a watt per path, uh, and so at 10 gigabits per second, which is what we were doing 15 years ago, that's about 100 picojoules per bit, which is enormous. Uh, and so we need to get away from that. And the reason for that is, is because everything on this is, is active. So even these passive shuffle networks, we're putting power in so that, uh, that they're transparent. So you can go forward from that, and, and working with partners in various European projects, uh, we, um, we worked uh, to do an active-passive switch, so again, indium phosphide-based. The sort of uh, gold things are, are the electrical contacts for the optical amplifiers, but everything else, you can just about see the waveguides here are, um, are, are passive. So it's indium phosphide, but a wider band gap, so they're sort of uh, transparent uh, to the light going through. And you can see we can get quite complex structures in plane. We can do things like bends. Uh, we can do things like crossings. Uh, and so this, um, this passive interconnect here has lots of crossings, lots of bends. Uh, so it's quite complicated. But we can make a device. And we can get very decent on-off ratios. This is something like uh, uh, a, a, a 40 dB on-off ratio uh, and, and, and quite nice performance. 
still relatively powerful. And the problem with it is, is because we've got these big, uh, we're, we're doing broadcast and select again, so if we're splitting eight ways, we throw away at the input uh, seven-eighths of our lights, and when we combine at the output, we throw away another seven-eighths of our lights. So it's very difficult to scale. If you make it bigger and bigger in terms of port count, then uh, you, you need vast amounts of amplification, uh, and uh, therefore the noise accumulates badly, and you, ca you can't scale these very fast. So and, and what you can do around that is to go away from the broadcast and select, and we've done that via... Uh, using Max Zender interferometers, so these are two by two switches, but you route the light instead of um, uh, splitting it and then blocking what you don't want. And that means you, you, your, your loss, at least your inherent loss, going through the, as the switch in theory is zero. Of course, there's a little bit, so we do put a little bit of amplification on there, small amount, uh, and, and that gives us two things. It, it makes the switch lossless, but it also uh, allows us to block any unwanted crosstalk because max zenders are interferometers. You don't get very high, um, uh, very high uh, crosstalk suppression. Uh, but putting the two together, you, you sorry, you can get to um, the 40 dB or so. So this was the, the first ever max zender SOA. Uh, it was about uh, six. Uh, six or seven years ago now that that, that was published. And, and nice work. And you can scale this quite well. It's got a very big input power dynamic range. And in, at least in theory, if you do, um, uh, if you do recirculating loop uh, through this, you can cascade it eight times, which means you can make it something like uh, 256 uh, um, by 256 um, sort of size, at least in terms of the, the noise and the loss budgets. Um, Having said that, though, uh, the, the indium phosphide uh, uh, switches tend to be uh, not so compact, and of course, uh, they, they're not as uh, mature as the technology compared to silicon photonics. So it's then useful to sort of look at silicon photonics, which has the downside, of course, it doesn't have gain. Uh, so uh, the, the, most of the switches I'll show in the next few slides do have loss. Uh, but you can, um, the, the fact that the silicon, of course, has a much higher refractive index means that you can uh, have much more compact features, so you can fit a lot more in the same bit of, uh, same sort of size of uh, semiconductor, but also uh, you can, um, uh, uh, it's a much more mature technology, uh, and, and so uh, it, it's much more precise and uh, much more scalable in terms of size instead of, two or three inch or four inch wafers, you can do 12 inch, of course. So um, without going into too much detail, th th this is a very similar architecture to the, the one I talked about before. So it's Max Ender interferometer based, but we're using thermo optic switches here. Uh, so it, it's not a fast switch, it switches in the order of sort of microseconds. But again, you can get very, very high performance. So here is the, um, this is the passband for, for each of uh, the, the, the route that we want to go through it for one of the inputs, and these are the, um, these are the suppressed uh, other ones, even though we're not using optical amplifiers now. So we're getting 40 dB uh, crosstalk here. The way we're doing that is instead of having one max zender, we, we cascade two, so we get the same crosstalk suppression for, um, for twice, so 20 dB per max zender. Uh, you, for many applications, and in particular for some of the AI ones, of course, you want to go much faster than that. So you want to be able to have a switch which, which isn't uh, based on the sort of thermo-optic thermo timescales, the, the microsecond or so time frame. You want to instead uh, make use of an electro-optic effect, so typically uh, voltage uh, modulation of the refractive index in the, uh, in the, in the CMOS. Uh, and, um, and that can, in principle, give you sort of um, five or ten nanoseconds or so switching time. Uh, in this particular case, we, we, again, it was an eight by eight switch. We didn't quite achieve that because, uh, mainly because of the parasitics. It wasn't, it was nothing fundamental about that. Subsequently, we have demonstrated uh, five nanoseconds, but we haven't published that yet. Uh, so um, th this, is, uh, uh, this is a device based on an electro-optic one uh, and uh, very, very similar performance. 
Now, how do we, um, uh, how do we try and make use of uh, even more compact structures? So these are the, what I previously talked about is Max Zenders. Uh, probably a more interesting uh, interferometer for a, uh, a, a semiconductor-based um, uh, photonic switch is a micro-ring resonator. And that's a resonator where you, you have a micro-ring, so it's a resonator, and you can uh, either go on resonance or off resonance and allow the light to either pass through on the bus or to be deflected to, a, to another path. Uh, and this is one which, which is, uh, uh, again, an 8x8 one. You can just about see here uh, an 8x1 micro-ring bus. So you send light in on a bus and you use one of eight micro-rings to drop to whichever path that you want to uh, go off on. And then you have a combined section at the other end. The thing here is you, you then have starting to get very... very the, the, when you start uh, scaling these things, you start to get very complicated, if you stay in one dimension, very complicated um, shuffle networks with vast numbers of crossings, each of which give you loss, but also give you a, um, a certain possibility of crosstalk. So what we've done here instead is to actually go to a three-layer network. So it's a sort of a three-layer um, uh, that there's not just one layer for waveguides, there are three layers for the waveguides. So it's the silicon uh, layer, which is the one where, where the switching takes place. But the shuffle consists, we have a, a vertical coupler, which takes us on into another um, silicon nitride layer now uh, for, for going north and south on, uh, on the shuffle. And we have a, a, a further uh, vertical coupler that takes us up uh, to another silicon nitride layer, which takes us east and west on the shuffle. And that way, all our crossings in the shuffle uh, are, are not going across each other. They're, going, uh, they're separated from each other. So we can get much, much better crosstalk uh, for very large shuffle sizes if we do that. And again, we're getting about 40 dB, but it's a much more comp which is similar to before, but it's a much, much more complex shuffle. They, of course, have sort of limited pass bands. So this has got 78, 72 gigahertz. That's the optical pass band. So just under a nanometer or so in the C-band. And we can make use of that, if I can get it to go down, by, um, by moving the, those pass bands around and therefore not only using it for space switching but also using it for wavelength switching as well. So if we have, uh, slightly difficult to see here, but if you look on that bus there, that there's a series of microwinds on this Max Zender structure here and on the top and the bottom thing. And they're, they're not there for intensity modulation, they're there for phase modulation for the uh, particular wavelength. So each of those rings modulates the phase for one of the wavelength channels. Uh, and so you can individually switch that max zender for each different wavelength. Uh, so we can have eight wavelengths going through this max zender and we can select which ones go out of the, the top port and which ones go out of the bottom port. And that way we can make, um, and in this case it's a, an eight by eight space switch, but also with an eight uh, multiplied by eight wavelengths. So a 64 by 64 switch in something like the same uh, uh, footprint as we had before. Um, and you can see here some of the, um, the well, here, here is the sort of uh, pass bands for each of the wavelengths for one of the paths, and we can, we can uh, switch them uh, between the two, as I mentioned. So 128 channels in this thing, each of them has got uh, uh, 30 dBs of extinction ratio. Um, and, and finally, using the microring, uh, using a dilated crossbar microring switch. So again, these, th this is a way of, um, of getting to very, very compact uh, structures. Again, we can, uh, uh, can design this to have wavelength space as well. So lots of different architectures uh, that, we're, that we're interested in, uh, and we're now getting to the point, as I said, where these are, are devices which are starting to get use in, in applications, uh, uh, both in sort of... Uh, uh, telecoms, so they're being used to in the European project for uh, uh, for radio access networks and, and switching uh, dynamically switching the radio access networks, and then uh, uh, and also in with, with Nvidia with data centres. 
Um, so what, what, what are we trying to do? So uh, Peter talked that, about this a little bit. Uh, we're, we're trying to sort of, um, uh, uh, the silicon uh, photonics, silicon nitride is very attractive, but it doesn't have gain. So we want to make, make these switches lossless. So again, uh, he talks about mic transfer printing. Uh, and this is an approach in the European Inspire project that we're doing with, with partners on that project. Uh, and we've looked at uh, ways of coupling from the, the silicon photonic chip into the microtransfer uh, printed uh, and, and the, the, the capsule for the, uh, the indium phosphide that, that is placed in there. And this is a device where, where that's been assembled. Uh, so silicon nitride with the 3.5 SOIs. Um, and we're going beyond that in a, a European project punch, so again, probably very similar to some of the things that are going on uh, with, with Peter at Tyndall, but this is one where we're, we're working with, with partners to um, take our, um, uh, our SOA-based uh, uh, 3.5 devices and, and couple them with silicon photonics and also uh, with um, electronics all on the same substrate. Uh, and uh, uh, so two and a half D integration. Um, Peter's described all that incredibly well, so I, I won't spend too much time on it beyond saying uh, that, that with partners we're trying to do that as well. Uh, and this is the sort of layout. So uh, here we, we've got our quantum dot switch. This is sort of the electronic and, and electrical, oops, sorry, uh, layout. Uh, and here is the sort of packaging approach, so uh, a, a, an IC substrate, solder bumps uh, for the um, electronics uh, and, and, and the chips. And then I think the electronic chips are, are flip chip mounted uh, uh, with, the, um, with the, the indium phosphide based devices. So I'll finish there just to uh, conclude. Uh, the um, photonic integration technology is advancing all the time. We're getting lower loss, we're getting improved signal to noise ratio. We're getting better scalability as a result of those, so port count, wavelength, functionality, uh, and heterogeneous integration in particular uh, is allowing us to combine the sort of positive aspects of indium phosphide, the gain, with the positive aspects of uh, silicon photonics, which is the compactness and, and, and the maturity. But which particular way of doing it, the jury is still out. Thank you. Running short of time, but maybe one very quick question, if there is one. Can, oh, there's one. Oh, Anna. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Very, very nice. Uh, my question is about the, the nanosecond reconfiguration time uh, optical switch that you were showing. Um, what would you say are the applications or the future applications maybe for this nanosecond reconfiguration time? And this is a question that we get a lot, and this is why I'm asking yeah, to you. Yeah, thank, thanks for that question. I mean, the, the many applications don't require it, uh, so the, the thermal optic switch is, is perfectly okay if, if you just want to allocate a path and then leave it for a long time. Uh, if you want to very dynamically switch the, the, the paths, uh, and so for instance, if you're trying to switch uh, reasonably, large, um, uh, reasonably large packets, uh, but, uh, but, but on a per packet basis, then of course if you spend uh, a microsecond doing the switch, then you, the, the, the amount of time that the switch is reconfiguring compared to the amount of time the data is there is, is tiny. So you do need the, the, the sort of a few nanoseconds only takes a few percent of the, the total capacity away. So that's where, the, where it's useful. Um, most applications don't require it, but, but some do. Okay, let's thank our speaker again.